It's not just a Jewish holiday today, the Feast of Trumpets, the Jewish New Year, Yom Teruah, Rosh Hashanah. There's also another holiday today that we, it's a triple holiday that we are blessed to be able to enjoy together. It is International Batman Day uh, today. And uh, since Batman, uh, his creators were Jewish, they were indeed members of the tribe. I call this a Jewish holiday as well. This year they all coincide on Rosh Hashanah. Shows you how religious the people at DC Comics are, Time Warner, uh, that they <laughs> didn't pay attention. But we're going to talk about not Batman Day. That'll be another sermon. Um, we'll talk this morning about the Feast of Trumpets. Now, when we look to the scripture, and say, well, what is the Feast of Trumpets? And what is, uh, what is given for us to understand regarding the Feast of Trumpets, Yom Teruah? Uh, there's very, very little. Here we find just a few portions, a few tidbits. Leviticus 23, verse 24, says, Speak to the children of Israel, saying, In the seventh month, on the first day of the month, it's Tishrei, the first of Tishrei, that would be today, started last night. Uh, Jewish calendar goes from, uh, Jewish day goes from uh, evening to evening, uh, sundown to sundown, on the first day of the month, so we're right in the midst of it right now, you shall have a Sabbath. Now, this is a, a Sabbath of Sabbaths because it's not just a Sabbath holiday, it's just on a Sabbath, uh, a memorial of blowing. Now, I have of trumpets in italics because it's not in the original Hebrew. That was helpfully added by your translators but it simply says a, a memorial of blowing, a zikron Torah. A memorial of blowing what? Doesn't say. It's a mystery. So you wonder, okay, uh, bubbles, uh, bubble gum, what am I to blow? Uh, trumpets, shofars makes the most sense. It is a holy convocation. You shall do no customary work. They shall offer an offering made by fire to the Lord. So this is all that is given regarding this holiday in the, uh, in the Torah. We are not given any uh, historical event on which to hang this day, to connect this day to as a memorial for uh, deliverance from Egypt. or It simply says a memorial. And it is to be like a... Shabbat, like a Sabbath. Now, in the New Testament, the rabbis, by the time, from the time of Moses to the time of Yeshua, 1,500 year span of time, and the rabbis can only tolerate a mystery for so long. And uh, by this time, they had decided, well, if the Lord is not going to reveal just how to observe this day, then we shall helpfully, for the sake of all Israel, provide some explanation and some traditions regarding this day. And so the New Testament, by the time we get to the New Testament, the Second Temple era, the first century, we see that the assignation of Rosh Hashanah, the head of the year, the new year, had been assigned. It was celebrated not just as a memorial of blowing, but as a memorial of the anniversary of creation. Uh, we have no specific record of Yeshua observing, but of course the Gospels don't tell us everything that Yeshua did uh, throughout his ministry. Um, it is a double day. Two days uh, become one, one big giant long, like a, a biggie sizing uh, your meal at Wendy's. Uh, and uh, it is the last quarter of a 40-day period of repentance. So 30 days precede this, a period of repentance, and now we begin the home stretch, the last 10 days of repentance. Um, and repentance because of why? Uh, because the rabbis, determining that it was the anniversary of creation, decided this is also the time that God will judge his creation. And so they call it Yom Hadin, the day of judgment. And so begins this home stretch, 10 days of awe. These are called the high holy days. This 10 
day period in the Jewish calendar is the holiest time of the year for the Jewish people. The idea being that no matter what sins you have committed through the year, that though your sins are like scarlet, as Isaiah 118 says, they shall be made white as snow. And uh, if we think about what this means to the Jewish people today, this holiday and its companion holiday, 10 days from now, Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, serve as the Jewish Christmas and Easter. Now, when I say the Jewish Christmas and Easter, I, I, what I mean is that just like so many Christians who don't dare darken the door of a church service throughout the year, except maybe they'll show up for Christmas and Easter, these big days, and if they're really committed, Mother's Day as well. Uh, but uh, these are the days when Jewish people who don't darken the door of a synagogue throughout the year, they will show up for Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur because it's so holy and so important to their destiny uh, because on this day, the book of life is opened in the heavenly courts and God will inscribe the names of his people in one of several books. I'll explain that in a moment. And the inscribing of names in the book will determine as God weighs these lives in the balance, God decides who lives and who dies. Now, again, this is not in the Bible. This is not Torah. This is not Moses. This is not the prophets. This is not the writings. This is not New Testament. This, however, is what Jewish people for almost 2,000 years, actually maybe more, because some of these ideas precede the Second Temple era, for that Jewish people believe this to be what this period of time is about. And when it comes to their relationship with, between themselves and God, it is focused around what these holidays concern. Let me explain what I mean by opening up a passage of uh, Talmud, uh, uh, Tractate Rosh Hashanah, and this explains that the Talmud is simply the oral the written version of the oral tradition of the Jewish people. And it explains here that uh, on this uh, uh, tractate, which is all dedicated to this holiday, three books are opened on Rosh Hashanah before the Holy One, blessed be He. So in other words, God has three books open. One of holy, wicked people. Now, make sure you're not just listening to it, but but. Watch how that's spelled, because we're not talking about, uh, uh, you know, <laughs> holy, wicked people. Uh, that doesn't make any sense. So we're talking about completely uh, not holy, uh, wicked people. And one of a holy, righteous people. And one of middling people whose good and bad deeds are equally balanced. So in other words, here's a book for the thoroughly righteous God doesn't have to give them a second thought. He knows how they're doing. They can go right into the book of life, no problem. And likewise, he also has the book uh, of those who are thoroughly reprobate. He doesn't have to give them a thought either because he knows their deeds. There's no ambiguity there. They go right into the other book. Um, but then you have what is called in Talmud middling people, those who are happy-happy, in other words, whose good and bad deeds are... Uh, more or less equally balanced. Holy, righteous people are immediately written and sealed for life. Holy, wicked people are immediately written and sealed for death. And middling people are left with their judgment suspended from Rosh Hashanah until Yom Kippur. Can you imagine the suspense? Now, who's going to, let's be honest, uh, how many people are going to think of themselves as thoroughly, uh, thoroughly righteous or thoroughly reprobate? Most people they wouldn't think of that. They say, oh, I, I, I have good, I have bad. I'm in the middle somewhere. So this is where most people put themselves in their minds that they have to influence God's decision because God is evaluating their lives uh, in the 10-day period between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. So he's going to write in pencil a preliminary judgment in pencil on Rosh Hashanah but he always can have an eraser and move from one book to the other, uh, but then he inscribes it and in, in, he seals it in indelible ink on Yom Kippur. So if they merit through the good deeds and mitzvot, 
commandments that they perform during this period. They're written for life. If they do not so merit, they are written for death. So your destiny is indeed on the line during this holiday period. Now, the idea of books of life, books of destiny, that's not a, you know, a pagan concept. That actually comes right from the Bible. Uh, Psalm 69, 28, may they be blotted out of the book of life and may they not be recorded with the righteous. So you have the idea of the book of life and you have the idea of the book of life even as early as Moses, Exodus 32, 32, when Moses says, look, if you're not going to forgive my people, then blot me out of the book. Now, if you will, forgive their sin. If not, please blot me out from your book, which you have written. So these are thoroughly biblical concepts which are taken to the next level by the creativity of the rabbis. Uh, and so again, the idea is that your life is being weighed in the balance. All of your righteous deeds placed on one end of a scale, all of your wicked deeds placed your sins, in other words, those, uh, those opportunities that you took to... Uh, to act incongruously with God's holy will. So righteous deeds congruent with God's will, sins, wicked deeds, incongruous with God's holiness. And these are being weighed in the balance by God. Can you imagine how that feels, just how weighty, for example, if you did a little introspection yourself, how weighty are your righteous deeds this year? How heavy are this year's sins, I wonder, if we had a scale and we placed one on each side? How would it go for you? It's interesting to consider as we enter into this day, just pondering whether your life truly hangs in the divine balance. Does it cause anxiety, tension, trepidation, terror? I can tell you for Jewish people who are serious about their faith and relationship with God, all of those descriptions are accurate. All of those emotions are indeed accurate. Can you imagine what it is like not to really be certain whether you have done enough for God to approve you for another year? Well, um, following this thought, there is an ancient prayer that is recited every year, the Unatana Tukef, very famous prayer. It goes back, the, well, the earliest copy we have comes from the, uh, the 8th century AD. So 8th century, so somewhere around, let's say, 700 uh, AD, um, this prayer was found in the Cairo Geniza. That was the, the retiree area, the, the garbage area. You didn't throw documents, prayers, holy books in the garbage, but you did kind of give it a ceremonial burial. And uh, this Cairo Geniza was discovered, and this 8th century text was found, this famous prayer, Unatanako Tokef, that the Jewish people recite even Today, it goes back at least as far as the 8th century, but this is the earliest document that we have. It's probably a lot older than that. And it goes like this, and this really has, helps us to enter into the theme. We shall ascribe holiness to this day, for it is awesome and terrible. So, it's not a fun day, not a play day. It is an awesome and not in like a Bill and Ted's Great Adventure way. Awesome. No. Awesome and terrible. Why? Your kingship is exalted upon it. Your throne 
is established in mercy, you are enthroned upon it in truth. In truth, you are the judge, the exhorter, the all-knowing, the witness, he who inscribes and seals, remembering all that is forgotten. Making a list, checking it twice, because he knows who's naughty, and it's not Santa Claus. Right? This is the God who made the heavens and the earth, the great judge, the great king, who remembers all that is forgotten, or conveniently forgotten. You open the book of remembrance, which proclaims itself, and the seal of each person is there. There's not one person who is going to fall through the cracks, who's not going to wind up in one book or another. I sure do hope to wind up in the right book. The great shofar is sounded. A still, small voice is heard. The angels are dismayed. They are seized by fear and trembling, and that's a new one. Because whenever you see angels in the scripture, whether Hebrew Bible or New Testament, they're the ones who are usually so scary, the first things out of their mouth is do not fear. What is so awesome, so terrifying, that the angels are seized by fear and trembling as they proclaim, behold, the day of judgment for all the hosts of heaven are brought for judgment. Not just humanity that is judged. The hosts of heaven likewise are judged. They shall not be guiltless in your eyes, and all creatures shall parade before you as a troop. As a shepherd herds his flock, causing his sheep to pass beneath his staff, so do you cause to pass, count, and record visiting the souls of all living. Now, New Testament, well, both Testaments gives us, uh, provide for us beautiful pictures of the Lord is our shepherd. And Yeshua, Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. I lay down my life for the shepherd. This is not the imagery here regarding the shepherd that this poem, that this prayer calls to mind visiting the souls of all living, decreeing the length of their days, inscribing their judgment. On Rosh Hashanah, it is inscribed, writing in pencil, and on Yom Kippur, it is sealed, indelible ink. How many shall pass away? How many shall be born? Who shall live and who shall die? Who shall reach the end of his days and who shall not? Who shall perish by water and who by fire? Who by sword and who by wild beast? Who by famine and who by thirst? Who by earthquake and who by plague? Who by strangulation and who by stoning? Who shall have rest and who shall wander? Who shall be at peace? Who shall be pursued? Little variety pack of destinies. Did I leave nothing out, no stone unturned? Who shall be at rest? And who shall be tormented? Who shall be exalted? And who shall be brought low? Who shall become rich? And who shall become impoverished? Well, when I was younger and I would hear this prayer, kind of a scary prayer, and I would look around every now and then and wonder, who? Who am I looking at who's here with me today? in the congregation who will not be here next year at this time. And wouldn't it be inconvenient if it was me? Um, uh, but, uh, but repentance, prayer, and righteousness, these three, avert the severe decree. So there is a way when God is weighing your deeds, there is a way to influence him. Lay on as much repentance, prayer, and righteousness to your scales to avert that severe decree. But let's actually do a little Hebrew. Let's get down into it. So repentance, these are important concepts. Repentance, teshuvah. 
We'll talk about that. Prayer, tefillah, you understand prayer. Righteousness, righteous deeds, in other words. Tzedakah, show me your righteous deeds. These avert, ma'averin. It's not avert so much as the idea of deflect. The severe, and again, it's not really severe. These are, this is how it's translated in the prayer book. But if you actually look at the Hebrew, these are polite terms. They're not as tough as the actual Hebrew is. Mavari, deflect, and roah is, uh, is, is not severe, it's evil. So the idea is not to avert as in to dodge, avert, let it pass over me, but literally to use your Shuva, your tefillah, your tzaddikah, repentance, your prayer, your righteousness to deflect this evil coming at you. You remember, you remember Wonder Woman, right? She's got two extraordinary bra bracelets, right? And she can deflect bullets or whatever is being fired at her and she can deflect, right? She's not averting, she's not dodging, she's not ducking, she is deflecting. Now she only has two bracelets. The Jewish people have three means by which to deflect this decree, righteousness, prayer, and repentance. They can deflect this, can't make it go away, can't make it invisible, and there's no getting away from the fact that Roah is not just grim, is not just awesome, is not just severe, but really is an evil decree. The terrible day of visitation has come. This is from the prayer book. And dread has seized all flesh. Assembled and with bended knee, they raised their thoughts aloft, even as a whole burnt offering. How about they offer a whole burnt offering? That's biblical. Well, they can't because there's no temple. So the provision that God made for the Jewish people, which was the Levitical system, blood sacrifice, life for life, it's not available to them. And so their prayers, their repentance, their good deeds, their, these must serve as substitutes. After all, the Bible says somewhere, doesn't it? Well, God desires mercy and not sacrifice. Not necessarily in lieu of sacrifice, but we'll make do as best we can with the tools that are available to us, or shall we say the tools that the rabbis have told the Jewish people that are available to them, the solutions that the rabbis have made known to them. But there is one solution that they have kept quiet, a secret from my people. Let's talk definitions very quickly. Uh, when we talk about repentance, Hebrew word teshuva, it means uh, to return to God, to turn. So it means that you are walking one way, a immoral way, and you are you have an immoral uh, 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 set of deeds, and you have changed your mind. You are turning morally in the opposite direction, and you are going to proceed with holiness, with righteousness. So that's teshuva, very important. And it's a time for the Jewish people when there is what I would consider bookkeeping of the soul, a time of meditation, a time of study, a time, of course, of prayers of repentance, chanting from the Psalms and praying for forgiveness. And you're praying for forgiveness with God, but of course, there is the vertical aspect of repentance and making sure that anything that you have offended God, you have uh, asked forgiveness for, but he also tells you, the rabbis especially, tell you that if you have something against someone else on a horizontal level, that you can ask God to forgive you for what you've done against your brother, but you're blowing smoke, you've got to go and approach your brother and, or sister and make peace. And only then 
can you receive that horizontal forgiveness. So you must have shalom, both vertically, peace, both vertically and horizontally. There are special customs involved, and one is uh, going to the mikvah, and tefillah is uh, uh, to immerse oneself uh, for, again, ritual cleanliness, ritual uh, holy. The baptism was not a Christian invention. It uh, comes from the Jewish people's Jewish custom that was adapted. Uh, and so this is one of those customs. Uh, there is also the ancient custom of eating the head of a fish, which in all my years as a Jewish fella, uh, I've never done. And I feel I'm, I'm neither a prophet nor the son of a prophet, but I feel pretty confident that I can say I will never do this one. Uh, it's one of those customs, and it comes from Deuteronomy 18, uh, 28, 13. The Lord will make you the head and not the tail, and you will be above only, and you will not be underneath if you listen to the commandments of the Lord your God, which I charge you today to observe them carefully. So this is a way of remembering that uh, you're going to have a year where you're going to be the head and not the tail. You are going to make out pretty well if you are uh, if you own stock in Hallmark, because uh, they sell a lot of cards, and the cards all say the greeting Lashana Tova to a good year or for a good year Lashana Tova, and uh, if you forget to send your Rosh Hashanah card uh, and you realize, uh oh, it's closer now to Yom Kippur, too late, save it for next year. There's another. Greeting for Yom Kippur, and it's Gemar Chatimat Tova, may you be sealed for good. So you couldn't send that for Rosh Hashanah, you couldn't send Rosh Hashanah for and wish Lashanat Tova uh, because you're praying and asking, may you be sealed. So uh, Hallmark's making that pretty well during this time. All right, there is the custom of Tashlich, you will cast all their sins into the depths of the sea, Micah 7 19. After services, the uh, Jewish people will go out to a uh, living body of water, a lake, a, a ocean, a, a stream, a river, whatever, and they will empty their pockets of lint or breadcrumbs, whatever they happen to have put in their pockets, and symbolically cast their sins into the depths of the sea. The young people generally will get together after this. It's a nice time, and it's a nice cheap date because everybody knows you have empty pockets. Uh, what can you spend? Uh, so the aspects of God that this holiday focus on is really four quadrants here. God is loving father and majestic king who tempers justice with mercy. And God is a judge. And the assumption is that this judge will be gracious Based upon what, however, is the question on which, uh, what will you base your assumption, your presumption, because there's a lot on the line, that God will be gracious to you? The rabbi's promises. So the Jewish person is truly seeking a relationship with God at this time of the year. The prayer of Eno Malkeinu, our father, our king, very commonly sung during this period of time, the 10 days of awe, our father, our king, be gracious unto us and answer us, for we have done no good things of any worth, a recognition of what Isaiah has said, all our righteousness is as filthy rags before him. So deal with us in charity and chesed, covenant loyalty, your loving kindness, and save us. So heartfelt prayer based upon hope, based upon Grace. The uh, Machzor, 
There's one for each holiday for Yom Kippur. Can you imagine there's so many prayers. These holidays are so long. There's, the services go on for so long that there's actually an entire prayer book just for Rosh Hashanah, an entirely other prayer book for Yom Kippur. Yeah, well, there are the Machsor. That's what I've been quoting. And in the Machsor, one point that I want to share with you, very, very important. It says in the Machsor several times, there is no righteous advocate to plead against the witness of transgression. Now, let me, before I unpack that, let me share with you that so many of the machsors of the prayer books that I have, they actually add a word. And that word, the word is not found when or if. It's not found in the Hebrew. But when they give you the translation across the, on the other side of the page, they usually add a when or an if. Because it is too heavy to accept what the Hebrew actually says, that there is no righteous advocate. So they'll say, well, when there is no righteous advocate to plead, then you'll be really good to us. Or if there is no right, but it simply says there is, not when, not if, but I'm sorry, there is. That's the tacit admission of the Jewish prayer book that amidst all the optimism, there is no righteous advocate to plead against the witness of transgression. What's happening here? Uh, in Hebrew, Bain Melitz Yosher Mol Magid Pesha. The picture is of heavenly courts. We've all seen enough TV, films, we know what a courtroom looks like if we haven't been in one ourselves. We know that uh, there's a judge and God is the judge in this instance. And you are the defendant. The individual is the defendant. So we got that. Now there is a prosecuting attorney. And according to the Jewish people, the witness of transgression, that prosecuting attorney is Hasatan, is Satan. And Satan is not pleading your case, but pleading the case against you. Every area of failure that you have ever engaged in, he brings up and he makes his case. Now, I've seen enough episodes of JAG and Law and Order that I know that there's always, you know, if there's a prosecuting attorney, there's always a defense attorney, right? That's, that's how it goes on TV. But that's not how it goes according to the rabbis. That there is no one to advocate our righteousness, our uprightness against or opposite the witness of the one who reports our transgression. And so we are left to defend our life. There was a film 30 years ago now called Defending Your Life. Uh, <laughs> Judgment City is uh, uh, re really, really close. It's just a few steps away. And here you are defending your life. The scales are there before the God, before our God, the judge. And Satan keeps adding pieces of our failure on the scale side of our sins. There is no righteous advocate. However, if the Jewish people were simply aware of what John the Apostle the disciple of Yeshua, the Messiah, wrote, dealing with this very issue, not in the gospel that I've been preaching, but in his first epistle. It is as if John recognizes this concept, this fear, this concern, that there is no righteous advocate to plead our, our case. There is no defense attorney before our God and our King. And John says, one moment, please. Oh, yes, there is. John, 1 John 2, 1 and 2. If anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. We have 
an advocate, and he is a righteous one indeed. Not only is he our advocate, our defense attorney, he himself is our propitiation. That's a fancy schmancy theological term for our, the satisfaction of our sins before God. He not only is pleading our case before God, but his very life, his sacrifice, is what is weighed against our sins. He is the propitiation for our sins, and not just for ours only, but also for the whole world. And if Yeshua, if Jesus is our righteous advocate, no matter who is pleading the case against you before the Father, case closed, the Father hears the Son, sees the blood of the Son, the sacrifice and obedience of the Son and attributes it to us. So let's get to the shofar. How is the shofar prophetic? We've heard the shofar prophetic in two ways. One is the rapture of the church, 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 and 17, for the Lord himself will descend with heaven from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet of God, that's the shofar of God, the dead in Christ, the Messiah, will rise first, and we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we shall always be with the Lord. We listen to the shofar, and we play it every week, because I want all who attend Beth Sar Shalom and all who watch at home I want you to become conversant. I want you to become familiar with that sound because this is just a foretaste of the sound that is to come that could happen at any moment when all of a sudden that shofar will sound and we will be caught up together with the Lord. 1 Corinthians, Paul also tells us here, behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we will all be changed, not just the slogan of every nursery. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, that's the tekiya gedola, that final blast that was blown today. For the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. The second way that this shofar is prophetic is the regathering of Israel at the end of the age, on that day, the Lord will thresh from the channel of the Euphrates to the wadi of Egypt, and you will be gathered one by one. Who, who, O oh people of Israel, Jewish people who had not been taken by the, the Jewish people, the, uh, just prior to the coming of our Lord, the second coming. It will come about also in that day. A great trumpet will be blown, and those who are perishing in the land of Assyria who, O people of Israel, Jewish people, and who were scattered in the land of Egypt will come and worship the Lord at the holy mountain in Jerusalem. No matter where the Jewish people may be, they will be brought to Israel. Israel today, the state of Israel, is not the fulfillment of the prophecies of the return of the Jewish people. It is but a foretaste. It is a shadow of the great return that is to come. And he will send forth his angels with a great trumpet and they will gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of the sky to the other. Now we must return to the passage that I read earlier today, the central passage, the Akedah, the binding of Isaac. Why is it the central passage? Because when it comes to the rabbis reassuring the Jewish people that even without blood, they can be accepted and forgiven by God, no matter what they've done. They must rely on some theological concepts based upon the binding of Isaac. In the Encyclopedia Judaica, we have uh, in the uh, uh, article on the uh, Akedah, Ibn Ezra, famous rabbi, Middle Ages, quotes an opinion that Abraham actually did kill Isaac you heard, listen, you heard the story I read. 
Isaac is not killed. Isaac is not sacrificed. There's a substitute, a vicarious atonement, right? The ram caught by its horns. Isaac is not sacrificed, almost, but not. But Abraham actually did kill Isaac, and he was later resurrected from the dead. Concept is correct, wrong Jew, wrong member of the family. Such views enjoyed a wide circulation, possibly in order to deny that the sacrifice of Isaac was in any way less than the sacrifice of Jesus. No, it's in no way less, unless, of course, you want to remember that Isaac wasn't actually sacrificed, but our Messiah was. Interpretations of Isaac's sacrifice as a means of atonement for his descendants were influenced by Christian doctrine. The Jewish people, hearing Christian's teaching of the vicarious atonement of the Messiah and applying his righteousness to the people, they said, we like that, it's so appealing. But it couldn't possibly be true of Jesus. It couldn't possibly be True of him. But we like that idea. And so we choose Isaac. And the Maxor, again, lo how they twain, sire and son, the two, sire and son, walk to Mount Moriah to consummate the sacrifice, obedient to your behest, and let their act of dedication be treasured up and be your mercies stirred so that the memory of your ancient oath may rise up. Remember us, remember unto us, O Lord our God, the covenant and the chesed, the loving kindness and the oath which you swore unto Abraham our father on Mount Moriah. And consider, consider the binding with which Abraham our father bound his son Isaac on the altar. When you look at us today, don't look at us. Look at our forefathers. Look at the righteousness of Abraham and the sacrificial righteousness of Isaac and put that on our account. Let the patriarch's work be remembered before you and his righteousness plead for our acquittal, that the accuser, that Hasatan, that Satan, may be silenced, shut his mouth through the work of our father Isaac. Oh, remember the binding of Isaac this day in mercy unto his seed. See his righteousness and place it to our account. Does that sound familiar? It should. For the merit of him that was bound, hearken from the skies to the neediest of mankind as they call to you from the abyss of oppression. Religious Jewish people understand the seriousness of sin. I can't speak for non-religious or secular, but I can tell you that in the prayer books, there is a very clear recognition that the Jewish people have no innate righteousness on their own that they can depend on, no matter what the rabbis say. For the sake of the only son who was proved, as he lay bound on the altar, grant his offspring redemption from the judgment sentence. For the sake of Isaac, be kind to us, in other words. He will yet remember the love. This is through the day. The Jewish people are reciting these prayers today and tomorrow. He will yet remember the love of the patriarch, our sire, yea, and for the sake of the son who was bound, he will still our strife. And for the merit of the perfect one, who is the perfect one? Isaac. Really? The all-feared God will bring forth our suit to the light of the acquittal again, Right concept attributed to the wrong Jew, trusting the wrong figure. Right idea, wrong direction. 
And do you have regard to the beloved child of the wanderer from the two rivers, that's Abraham, even unto him who was fast bound on Mount Moriah, Isaac, and mindful of his ashes, of his ashes, he wasn't sacrificed. Not only is he sacrificed, in these prayer books, he's treated as if he actually was a burnt offering, a guilt offering for the Jewish people and came back to life. Be mindful of his ashes. Be you gracious to the remnant of his sons. Right concept, wrong direction. They are supported by the memory of his ashes, who was bound like a lamb, of him who is the gift of your visitation. The true gift of God's visitation is the word, the word who was with God, the word who was God. And the word came and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory of the only Son of God, our Messiah, Yeshua. Well, let's give the rabbis a break for right now because they aren't completely off base when they saw a connection between Isaac and Jesus. Both, of course, were sons of promise. Uh, both had miraculous births. Both sons were obedient. Both sons so obedient that they were willing to lay down their lives if their father requested that they do. It's not like Isaac uh, and his father Abraham, 100 years old, that he wrestled with uh, Isaac and, and he won and got and hogtied him, pardon the expression, to the altar. Isaac, strapping young man, willing to lay down his life, lay down on the altar and entrust himself to his father, just as our Messiah offered his life and entrusted himself to his father. Both even carried the wood to their sacrifices. Yeshua, of course, carrying the cross beam. Isaac carrying the wood for the altar. And both had loving fathers, loving fathers who, who loved them in a unique and intimate way. But nonetheless, both fathers were prepared to slay them. But God did not ask of Abraham what he required of himself. And Abraham did not need to go through with Isaac what our father needed to go through with his son Yeshua. And so both sons gave their lives. Time of judgment. And yet we live in an era when nobody wants to be judged. Don't tell me I'm wrong. This is my truth. This is my life. And I can live the kind of life that I want to live. And I do not need you or anyone else calling me to account. I am unaccountable to anyone but myself and living and being true to my own truth. Don't judge me. Even if there's such a thing of, as God, he has no right to judge me. But this is a day of judgment. This is a period of judgment. And speaking of judges, our nation lost someone yesterday. And it reminds us that though the world says, do not judge me, the day of God's judgment is nonetheless inevitable. That's not maybe your truth, but it is the truth according to God's word. 
The day of God's judgment is inevitable. And we do not know. There are no guarantees as to how long we have before he calls us to account, before our accounts come due. If you have trusted in our Messiah, whether you're Jewish or non-Jewish, if you've trusted that Yeshua, that Jesus is your Messiah and that his life lived in perfection to the Torah and his sacrifice made on our behalf to take God's penalty upon himself and suffer on our behalf. If you believe that that is what happened with Yeshua, that his life was given so that you may live. Same idea, vicarious atonement that the rabbis speak of with Isaac. If you believe that of Jesus. And if you know, and if you believe that even though Jesus gave his life for us, that on the third day, he was raised he came back to life, never again to die, conquering death on our behalf, ascending to God and seated thereafter at the right hand of power, then we know that when it comes to will our sins outweigh our righteous deeds, we never have to worry. Because according to the scripture, of course, our sins are always going to outweigh our righteous deeds. That's the human condition. Thank you, Adam and Eve. But because of what Yeshua has done, because of what Jesus has done, and his righteousness laid to our account, there is absolutely no question. Our righteous deeds are sufficient because our righteousness comes from the Messiah. And so it will be indeed a good year for us no matter what happens, no matter what's in our future, immediate or far, it will always be a good year because eternity has begun for us. Our relationship with God could not possibly be any more intimate. But if you have not trusted Messiah, that Jesus, that Yeshua is your Messiah, how weighty are your sins? How heavy your righteous deeds? How confident are you that you've done enough, that you can be sure that you're good for the, you're good to go, that you're okay, A-OK -okay in the eyes of God? Not a position I would like to be in. And obviously not even a position that the rabbis teach the Jewish people to be in. You must rely on God's grace. The question is, will it be grace that is based on truth? Will you rely on optimistic but unfounded promises of God's grace or will you trust in the Messiah of Israel, conqueror of death for all of us? We lost Ruth Bader Ginsburg, Justice Ginsburg. And um, I take no joy in her loss. She made an amazing contribution to her country. And while <clears throat> I myself probably agreed with maybe no more than 10 or 20% at most of her rulings, she represented the Jewish people with honor and distinction. 
And I believe that her loss on Erev Rosh Hashanah, on Erev the Feast of Trumpets, is a sign, not a prophetic sign, I mean, just a, a sign, is a symbol, is a picture, a reminder to us that there are no guarantees that just like Justice Ginsburg, any day could be our last day. I can only pray, I can only hope that the God of Israel, his Messiah, made himself known to Justice Ginsburg prior to her final passing. I will trust that the judge of all earth has done right, but I have no guarantee of that. I have no way of knowing. And so let her passing be a reminder that life is fleeting and that there is only one that we can count on, and that is God and his Messiah. There is only one that we must entrust ourselves for a certain future, no matter what this temporal life may hold. We must trust in Yeshua. And so I would like, as we end this uh, and go right into the, uh, the announcements after this and then the final blessing. Um, I would like us to stand and in memory of Justice Ginsburg, as well as anyone that we have lost in our own lives, I would like us to recite the Jewish prayer of mourning, which is the Kaddish, the mourner's Kaddish. So please stand with me. It's not a prayer for the dead. It's a prayer that when death comes, reminds us, the living, to glorify God and helps to refocus us from our own perspectives to his divine perspective. And so we will leave it with this. So if you would please read with me. Magnified and sanctified be God's great name in the world which he created according to his will. May he establish his kingdom during our lifetime and during the lifetime of Israel. Let us say, Amen. May God's great name be blessed forever and ever. Blessed, glorified, honored and extolled, adored and acclaimed, be the name of the Holy One. Though God is beyond all praises and songs of adoration, which can be uttered, let us say, Amen. May there be peace and life for all of us and for all Israel. Let us say, Amen. Let he who makes peace in the heavens, grant peace to all of us and to all Israel. Let us say, Amen. Let's pray. Our Father and our God, we remember your greatness and we ask you now, Lord, to bear your great and powerful arm and make yourself known to your people Israel. Let this season of repentance and focus on you. May this be the time when you make yourself and your son known to your people Israel and increase our remnants speedily and in our days. We pray, Lord, for the family and for those close with Justice Ginsburg. Uh, we pray, Lord, for our nation, which, oh my, if we were divided yesterday, tomorrow, we could only imagine. But you know, Lord, and we pray, Lord, that you superintend that your will be done on earth and in this nation as it is in heaven. 
Well, for thine is the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen.